So welcome, everybody. Let's pray. Well, Father God, we want to thank you, as always, for the multitude of your blessings and grace and mercy in our lives, Lord God, that we can indeed come before you and uh, recognize, Lord, that your word is true, that you have given it to us as a gift to learn and study and to apply in our minds and our hearts, Lord God, so that we can live properly before you and think properly as we look at the world around us, Lord God. So we want to dedicate our hearts and our minds and our ears and uh, my speech, Lord God, to your service tonight, Lord God, that we would be uh, fully devoted to learning and understanding what your Holy Spirit would guide us and lead us in tonight. So I want to surrender to him and ask for your presence to be here. And we give you thanks for this time and opportunity and bless those who are here and bless those who may be watching online now or in the future. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we are studying through the book of Genesis. We... Um, spent, gosh, I, I keep, you know, I'm not trying to uh, do anything other than get through it at the pace that I feel I can get through it. And here we are 16 lessons in, that's 32 hours tonight, and we're at chapter 11. So, But I do expect, I said this a couple of weeks ago, and we'll keep doing it, do expect that as we get really into more narrative rather than uh, highly historical and scientific kind of things, that we'll probably hit two or maybe th even three chapters in a given night. Uh, you know, for a couple of hours, but, you know, tonight we're still kind of getting through some very uh, important topics again in chapter, we looked at chapter 10 last week, and chapter 10 is what some, most commentators or Bible, help, uh, study Bibles and whatnot, Bible aids will call the table of nations, because it talks about all of the families that descended from Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and how really all of the world has been populated through them and through no one else but them. We'll look at some of that dispersion again tonight. We didn't uh, cover like the territories that they dispersed into because the story of the dispersion is really in chapter 11. And we've talked about this several times in the, our study so far. It is very common in Hebrew language and writing in the Old Testament for... Uh, a um, summary to be given in one section or chapter as we would break it up and call it like Genesis chapter 1 and then you get into Genesis chapter 2 and it's not contradiction it's simply giving you more information that the first overview did not provide and we see that exact same model between chapters 10 and chapter 11 of Genesis so chapter 10 is focused on who descended from who Right, or whom, or however we want to say that. So it's who, 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 how did these populations of the world come about? How did they get across the globe and all of those things? Well, what chapter 10 didn't communicate to us, even though it gave us a whole long list of names or a fairly long list of names, is it didn't tell us about the main event that caused them to scatter, caused them to go abroad and, and to fill the earth. Um, and that is, of course, a very famous Tower of Babel, 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 all kinds of different ways we can say words as we transliterate them. But uh, we'll see that, you know, the, the primary event of chapter 11 is both the Tower of Babel and its fall, and also how that led to the next main narrative account, which is Genesis chapter 12, where we get introduced to Abram, or Abraham eventually, that most of us know, and uh, easily one of the most, if not the most important character in the Old Testament, person of the Old Testament, maybe the most important person of all time other than Jesus himself. We'll talk about that as we get there, while he, why he is so important and why so many faith groups that are still operating today to try to trace their heritage back to Abraham because they recognize that the blessings that God gave to Abraham are so significant and they're so uh, important that they still carry forward in today. And each group, specifically talking about the Jewish faith, the Muslim faith, and the Christian faith, all of us tie back and say the, the multitude of God's blessings and promises come through the blessing that God originally gave to Abraham. So we'll look at that um, as we get into chapter 12 tonight. So chapter 11, it's like, as I said, it's the more detailed account that chapter 10 didn't provide for us, and that is how did all of these people groups, ethnicities, I'll try my best to purge the word race from my vocabulary in all of this because there is only one race. There's a human race. We saw that with Adam and Eve in the garden. We see that with Noah and his wife and their sons and their wives. That can only be one race of people. 
um, kind of people, as Genesis 1 would say. God made everything according to their kinds. Uh, but obviously, there's plenty of ethnicities, meaning God built into the human uh, genome everything we need to have all of the diversity that we see in the world and have seen in the world for the last 6,000 years. I mean, we are nowhere close to exhausting that. Uh, some of the mathematical uh, calculations on the variability that two parents, a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, can generate within, um, generate just by their own DNA sequences is, I believe it's 10 to the 2,043rd power meaning you multiply 10 times 10 times 10, 243,000 times and get some great big huge number with 2,000 zeros after it. And that's the number of, of non-identical gene sequences that can come from any two parents, right? So you'll never see, other than identical twins, you'll never see two people who have all of the same characteristics. There may be doppelgangers and things like that. I can't tell you how many times people walk up to me and go, have I met you before? And I'm like, yeah, no, I just apparently have a face that is so common that everybody has one, but, uh, but we have the, this genetic variability and it's built in, and of course that also explains the animal kingdom and how you can have all these different kinds, not species, although species come from kinds, but you can have all these different kinds that were on the ark, about 7,000 animals on the, on the ark, and you can have them and disperse and you get all of the multitude of animal kingdom diversities that we see out there, including the humankind. So with that as a backdrop, let's take a look here at Genesis chapter 11. We'll look at the first nine verses um, and see how the, really the events of the Tower of Babel. So again, we looked at the sons and offspring. So and oftentimes we'll say sons and daughters, but Rarely do we get the female's name, the woman's name, or the daughter's name listed, but we always sort of get the, the patriarch's name so that we can see where these family groups and ethnicities came from. So chapter 11, verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But Yahweh came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And Yahweh said, indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So Yahweh scattered them abroad from there over, over the face of the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there Yahweh confused the language of all of the earth, and from there Yahweh scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. Okay. So, obviously, um, a, you know, something that greatly offended God was going on here in terms of this city, this gathering of people, and the, it seems to be, and it, we'll talk about all the different parts, but failing to actually obey his command. He said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And here they are uh, seeming to do opposite in addition to building a tower which probably had no God-honoring God purposes associated with it. So we'll talk about that. All right, so the Tower of Babel, or those from Australia like Ken Ham and whatnot, or we'll say Babel, um, but Tower of Babel, the whole earth had one language and one speech. The word speech there is like lip. Okay, like they had one way of communicating, one dialect. Okay, so one, one language, one speech. So it, to me, I'll just walk through some of this. It, we can't, this is just speculation here, but it seems unlikely that there would have been other languages pre-flood. Okay, so we had 1,656 years before the flood, then one year in the flood. And it seems to me, there's never mentioned, there's no statement about anything in Scripture, so given the fact that we have no reference to a different language happening, probably for 
nearly 2,000 years, there was only one language on all the planet. We would, we, you know, it was one logical extended guess or speculation that can come from this. Okay. But even if, let's, let's say the other side of things, let's say there's, there were multiple languages that happened, probably within one family unit, there was probably one primary or dominant language. Therefore, if there were a hundred languages on the earth prior to the flood, Noah's family probably spoke one language, or maybe they spoke 20, but there was one that was a common one that they used. And after the flood, they, that's the language that they taught to their children. My guess is, though, it probably was one language, and it probably doesn't change anybody's perception or view of anything. It's just, you know, trying to fill in the gaps of information. And Scripture does not indicate what the original language was, but Hebrew seems more likely to me, as, you know, somebody who studied this, um, than any other language. We're not told of any other languages. We're not told of anything other than there's a scattering of languages. And I, I come to that conclusion, not, certainly not all scholars do, and I don't know how you would ever come to any type of definitive statement about what, what the original language of the planet was, but I can tell you why I think Hebrew probably was the original language. Again, it doesn't change our perception of theology or the interpretation of Scripture at all, but here's why. So Hebrew has several unique properties that suggest that uh, this may have been the original language, or if not, if not that, if not the original language for verbal communications for the first 1,657 years or whatever, um, I think it was obviously God's intended language for communicating Scripture to his people. Okay? There's, because of the unique properties in it. But they just they link up so much. The names of people, what the names mean in Hebrew, and how those link to certain factors are, seem to be important to the story. Therefore, if you change the name, you also have to, or change the, the language, then you also have to make the language, the secondary language, mean the same thing that it means in Hebrew, I think, to make it work. Um, and there's some really, like, just with Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, there's interesting, interesting characteristics of how God has put his fingerprint to say, I'm the author of that, okay, in the sense of it's all multiples of seven, you know, there are the seven different, seven words in the original Hebrew language, and uh, seven, you know, uh, the way it just breaks out. I didn't bring that tonight. I've, I've covered it before, but just it's, it's very, very structured is the point. Um, and I'll show you some other things as well. What you may or may not know about Hebrew, and you don't have to know it, but let's give you a, a kind of a picture here. Hebrew uses both uh, meaningful symbols, semims or whatever, and alphabetic characters. Okay, now, like, Chinese has, like, graph, it's kind of a graphical language, right? But then you also have, um, like, English, a, a you know, a, a, kind of like an A-frame house with a, you know, slash in it. It doesn't have any, any in, inherent meaningful communication. A child isn't going to grow up, and you never teach that child the alphabet. They're not going to look at an A and go, well, surely the pronunciation of that letter would be A, it just, it does, you have to teach them, this letter represents this sound. Hebrew, the symbol represents the, the idea or the concept behind the actual vowel, plus, plus, or in addition to, you can pronounce it. So it's a very unique language where it has both symbolic interpretation meaning and it has verbal communication or written communication characteristics. It makes it very unique and it makes it very valuable to um, the study of the, of the Hebrew language and the Old Testament. Okay. So each letter has a representative visual meaning, right, as well as um, its, its actual pronunciation or sounds that go along with it. So I'll talk about this here in a minute. I've covered this before, maybe on a Sunday, but we'll cover it again here. Like the Aleph and Beth and the Hey, three, just three letters that I'll talk about here in a moment. Um, and, of course, I just mentioned the design properties of Genesis 1.1. It, it just naturally seems that, that when God says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, that he wanted that to demonstrate who he is and that he is the author of Scripture from the very first verse. Okay. Um, and then we'll talk about this uh, just in a moment. This is on the same slide. And it came to pass, this, and it came to pass, they traveled or they, they journeyed to Shinar, just as indicating that this is somewhere between the end of the flood and Terah or Abraham. 
that we'll talk about here in a little bit. So somewhere in that several hundred year gap, they moved to Shinar and these events took place. If we were to go back to chapter 10 and look at all of that, like it says, in the days of Peleg, the, the earth was divided. Right? This, he's kind of in a middle, middle row or up, maybe upper middle. Is That's just an indication that this is not happening after all that was recorded in chapter 10. This is chapter 10 and this Tower of Babel event is happening somewhere between these two time markers, the flood or the end of the flood and Abraham. Okay. So let me walk you through this. Hopefully this has some value to you just in support of this idea that Hebrew is an important language. Okay. So um, this comes from my love series that we did about three years ago. But God is love. We know that that is what 1 John 4, 8 and 4, 16 says, that God is love. He doesn't, he's, he doesn't just express love. It's who he is. It's like the ontological nature or the essence of God is love, one of his primary characteristics. So let me walk you through this with these three letters and see if I can make my case as to why I think Hebrew is really an important language and probably the original, just as a speculation. So on the screen, the top, if you don't know Hebrew, that's the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It comes in kind of different, you know, different styles and scripts and stuff like that. But it's an aleph, um, and it was the way they originally drew it, as we understand it, had the idea of an ox head, okay? And the ox is traditionally, in Hebrew, a symbol of strength or headship, okay? So aleph has strength or headship associated with it, okay? Um, and then this is the bet, okay? Kind of looks, in, in its original, it kind of looks like a tent, okay? Um, and so the second letter had this house tent-like kind of visual imagery to it. Um, it's also in kind of considered a symbol of safety or security because you're, you know, in your own house, there's some level of safety that most people would feel, okay? Just, so you got two things there. You got strength and safety, or strength in house, okay? So it shouldn't surprise us that if you put those two letters together, that symbolically the strength of the house is the head of the house is the father, Ab, okay? So A, Aleph, and Bet come together. One means head or strength, and one means house or safety, you put the two together, and they actually have a logical connective meaning. The strength of the house is the father. Ab is the word for father. Most of us can recognize that that even translates into the New Testament, like in Romans, where it says we call him Abba, father, Romans chapter 8, right? Abba is just a little, little more extended version of the Ab, Hebrew, Hebrew term or Hebrew name for God, or I'm sorry, for, for father, okay? So let me, as we're going to talk about Abraham tonight, we can throw this into him as well. So you might recall, here's uh, the Ab, if we took, because you read from right to left, okay? Um, Ab is here, and then we've got Ram. A Abram is Abram's name, or a Abram's name. I, in this case, call it Abram. And his name means the exalted father. So this Abram means exalted father. So you can see from Abraham's name, originally, he had this title of exalted father. Of course, he went 75 years, and then he went 100 years before he became a father, um, or 86 years until he got Ishmael, and then 100 years until he got the promised son in, in Isaac. Okay. Um, but then we'll see here in a few chapters down the road that God will give him a new name, and all he did was add this third letter I mentioned earlier called a hey. So Abram, or Abram becomes Abraham, he puts the hay in there, okay? And that hay, represented right here, okay, um, is kind of like a breath. You go, Abraham, Abraham. He also did the same thing with Sarah's name. Sarah became, or Sarai became Sarah. Uh, you have to kind of breathe out to get that letter out, okay? So it's kind of like the breath of the person, or some would say the essence of the person. So Abram, the, the, the exalted father becomes Abraham, the father of a multitude. Now, you may be going, well, this, I still don't get why you're trying to cover all this. Let me try to get there, okay? So again, you see, I, I, we, put, we change the name. The top here, Abram, becomes Abraham, 
okay, the father of the multitude, by adding one letter, called it a he, okay? So as I said, it requires this breathing out kind of sound, ha, and you can kind of, it, it symbolizes that, the essence of something, because it's, it's where our breath comes from, okay? So, ab, again, becomes his father, because it's the strength of the house, okay? A, a, a hob, I wonder what that could be. The strength of the house is the father. What's the essence of the father? Well, I already told you, it's love. And this is no coincidence, that's the Hebrew word for love. Ahab is the Hebrew word that we would say, if you love somebody or you express love, ahab is the word. How did did they construct that word? With the strength of the house is the father, and the essence of the father is love, and the essence of our heavenly father is love. This starts to me, and this is just one little teeny tiny example of the Hebrew language, seems to me that this is really dedicated to expressing the heart of God as a language, and therefore I kind of make the case that Hebrew might be the original language, and it survived through the lineage that led to Abraham, and led to David, led to Jesus, because it's the original language, and we've got hundreds of languages that have outpoured, thousands actually now, of languages that have come out from that. And again, scholars may or may not agree with this. I just think that the properties of Hebrew make it so interesting that it probably, it certainly is the language God selected and chose to communicate all of the old, virtually all the Old Testament, except for those um, Aramaic passages. But I think it's probably also the one that is the one that Adam spoke and Noah spoke. Be my guess. You can feel free to disagree. There's no reason to say that this is the only way to look at it. But I thought that might be helpful in terms of this. There's one language and one speech. And gosh, what was that language and speech? It seems easy to say it was Hebrew, but it also seems logical and consistent with the message of Scripture that there needs to be no transliteration or translation from that original language of the, as the one that God communicated, that he's the creator of heaven and earth, that he's the one who uh, spoke to Noah to build the ark, he's the one who is going to call Abraham and speak to Abraham about his blessings that we're going to see here in chapter 12. So, I mean, I can answer questions on that. I'm not a linguist or a Hebraist, but I have studied the language. And, I, and I, every time I study Hebrew, um, even more than Greek, I try to study Greek too, but every time I study Hebrew, I, I'm more and more impressed by God's awesomeness in how he designed that language to function. Um, he, Greek is precise and is very, you know, the perfect language to communicate the New Testament to us in. But Hebrew is a beautiful, beautiful language and, and I think it's, um, it's, God invented it either way, but I think it because he, he used it to communicate the Old Testament to us, it, you know, I'll, I'll get off the soapbox. I just think it probably indicates that it was um, the original language. Kirk. Has it changed oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, the, 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 character, the style of the characters, whether handwritten or type, you know, typed out on a computer, the, the actual looks of it have changed. Um, Hebrew went through a season where it almost died, okay, after the Babylonian conquest and after the Medo-Persian conquest, and you get to Greek, and then their Greek becomes the enforced language of the world. Hebrew almost dies, and, and through periods of the, a long period of time, Hebrew basically almost died and had to be resurrected, if you will, in terms of getting back to the original text that we can actually understand it. We, I don't know the percentage, but there's still some words and some uh, uh, sentence constructions that are very baffling. You know, we still struggle with because it almost died as a language. And of course, modern day Hebrew, you know, or modern day um, Hebrew is, is very different than biblical Hebrew um, in that. I think there was one other thing I was going to say in response to that. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think that's it. So, you know, it, it definitely has morphed and changed, but we are blessed that we actually now have people who have dedicated their entire, you know, professional careers to studying Hebrew and kind of trying to bring it back to the beauty and the, the accuracy that it communicated when the scriptures were written. Yeah. 
All right. So that's just a little side detour and a bunny trail, whatever you want to call it, into talking about what this original language may have been. So what it says, it's interesting to me, it says this text there that we read, it says, they journeyed from the east. It kind of sounds like, again, this is somewhat speculative, kind of indicates to me that Noah, his sons, and all their offspring, however many were there at this time, seem to be living in and moving about in a very large group. Because they're talking about they're not scattering abroad. They're not moving around. All the world, all the people had one language, one speech, and they traveled to Shinar. So it sounds like there may have been um, kind of a big family and probably moving as a group. Can't prove it. Certainly can't prove it otherwise, but it seems like that it's just saying that all the people were moving about as a group. Uh, we know from chapter 10 that this family of Noah was multiplying, um, but perhaps they really weren't spreading out to fill the earth, and God had obviously intended that. So in this group setting, whether it was 100% of all the human population or some subset of it, the family traveled to the land of Shinar. Shinar means cast out of the breach as best as we can understand it. Okay. Um, it can also mean uh, like between the valley or a valley between the mountain ranges or something like that. Um, but like cast out of the breach. Um, I believe part of the reason for this journeying uh, was because of the continued after effects of the flood, right? So we talked about this before, um, that there's the, the best, you know, Christian or, or, or young earth, if you will, scientists who study all these kind of things, look at it and say, look, the, the, the global flood was far more than just water. We've got volcanic activity, we've got tectonic activity, we've got global floods reshaping and reforming the landscape, and as I mentioned several weeks ago, and, and, or over the last uh, several weeks, uh, we believe that created lots and lots of changes to land masses and the volcanic activity and all of that, which would have warmed the oceans, and those warm oceans would have created massive amounts of evaporation. Those massive amounts of evaporation would come down and probably are, are the catalyst for the single global ice age that took place on the planet. Um, and we see evidences of the global ice age that would have followed and seems to have followed the flood, not preceded the flood. Okay. So these ice, this, this changing climate and changing conditions of the earth may be why the people are moving. They're up there. Remember, they landed the ark, or God landed the ark, up there in the mountains of Ararat. Okay. Probably not on the tippy peak, but somewhere in those great big mountain ranges there in modern day you know, Turkey area. And uh, they, the, here's the ark sitting up there. They come down. Well, they're still in pretty high elevation. And, you know, they're, they're, you know we know about Noah planting the vineyard and all of that. But probably they're, they're, with the ice age and the changing, they may be finding themselves, we've got to get lower and lower and lower towards sea level or something. And they keep moving. And they find a place where they can inhabit um, in Shinar. It's, that's my, again, speculative guess. But they're probably on the move because the earth is ever changing as a result of trying to recover from this global flood, okay, which obviously occurred and eventually turns much of the, uh, uh, of the Middle East that we're talking about into an arid desert. But at one time, it was almost certainly part of a global ice age and, and trying to recover from all of the effects of the global flood. Okay. So they're sojourning and they're moving. And as a reminder, you probably can't see a darn thing up here. I can barely see it on my screen. Um, but here's Noah's family. Let me just give you a quick tour. Right? So you got Noah up here and his three sons, Shem and all of Shem's, which is you know, uh, the, the Hebrew people um, in, in here. You got Ham, and he's got the most offspring listed in chapter 10. And then you got Yapeth um, over here. He's probably got the smaller of the group, but... Most Europeans come from Yapeth, so we're probably more connected to Yapeth than we are Shem and Ham, uh, genetically. Uh, but there's a great big people group. So I, all I put this on the screen for, even if you can't read a single name on here, is to indicate, chapter 10 indicates they're doing well repopulating the earth. I mean, they're doing well with that. So stage one is okay. Be fruitful and multiply. Stage two and fill the earth seems to be the lacking part. 
They're staying huddled together. They're building a big city. They're not moving. They're not scattering about. Um, here's kind of an interesting picture of that region. If you know, if you're familiar at all with the Mediterranean Sea and the Red Sea and the, Met and the Persian Gulf and all that, these are the areas that we're looking at. Um, and so here's your, you know, here's your Persian Gulf, here's your Red Sea, here's the Mediterranean Sea. Here's the, over here in this area would be where the Ark landed in the mountains of Ararat. This map is interesting because it talks about cultivated land. Notice what they call the Golden Crescent. We've always talked about the Golden Crescent. This is where, and this is Shinar, Babylon and Shinar is right in here. They're finding the ability to have, engage in agricultural activities here and down into Egypt way over there. Okay, so they, they come down out of the mountains or whatever, somewhere up in this range, and they travel down into this range uh, to engage in, in you know, life-sustaining agricultural activities. More, more than likely, they found a good plot, and they decided, let's make bricks, let's build a city, and let's build a tower. Okay. Here's a, uh, a little bit more accurate map, if you will. It doesn't include that, but... You can see on this topographical detail that, you know, there's mountain ranges in here, there's mountain ranges up in here, and we've got, um, you know, all this Arab desert over in here. Here is where the map indicates is Shinar, just above the Persian Gulf, you know, in modern-day Iraq. So, um, and it seems to be out of the mountain ranges, so it's probably less subjected to the uh, global ice age effects that are probably taking place in those hundred or so years after the flood. And they probably have, because of the Tigris and Euphrates River flowing through here, they probably have pretty decent supply of water for whatever agricultural activities they're engaged in. All right, moving forward. So the family traveled to Shinar. Of course, um, what Shinar, and we would call it today Babylon or Iraq, what it looks like today probably look quite different than it did 4,400 years ago, immediately after the, the floodwaters had dried up and immediately subsequent to, if you will, whatever the length and duration of that global ice age may have been. Okay. So we can't look at it today. My point here is you, you can't go over to Iraq or Babylon or whatever today and go, why would anybody want to build a city here? Okay. Don't assume that what it looks like today is the same thing it looked like 4,400 years ago. To them, it probably looked absolutely pristine. In fact, don't forget, you know, uh, Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon built, built the Hanging Gardens. He created a very lush city in his, as his capital city. So um, it's not quite the w barren desert wasteland that most of us probably think of when we think about what we saw on TV with Desert Storm and whatever else um, over in those areas. So it most likely appeared uh, to offer all the water and agricultural features that Noah's family would have desired and probably felt like it was, you know, well worth investing the time and resources to actually build the city that they wanted there. Because they traveled from less favorable regions, um, they probably felt that this location seemed to be, you know, maybe it also resembled the pre-flood conditions that Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth thought, this is what home used to look like. Okay, we, we landed the ark up there in the mountains. We've never seen mountains like that before. And we're, we're scrambling around and moving down. And they get down to whatever Shinar looked like 4,400 years ago or 4,200 years ago and went, this looks like home. This looks like it was before we got on the ark and everything changed. Again, speculation, but they probably felt, I, I'm guessing, a level of comfort or familiarity with the land that they decided, this family decided to build their houses on. And remember, Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth are all living quite long periods of time. Uh, Noah lived 350 years after the flood. So it's not like he didn't, couldn't have told people, well, this is what the earth looked like beforehand. And Shem, Ham, and Japheth didn't live 950 years. I've got their table here in a minute, but they certainly lived several hundred years after the flood as well. All right. So settling in Babylon, here now they've made it to Shinar, we'll call it, ba it, it wasn't called Babel or Babylon then because it didn't get that name until the languages got confused, but for our sake, for convenience sake, let's say that uh, we're, we'll call it Babylon because it's the Tower of Babel and it's the city of Babylon that they were building and all that. 
So they determined to make bricks for their building projects, a skill I'm guessing they already knew from prior generations. Remember from chapter 4 of Genesis, they're already making metal, or metal tools, and they're making musical instruments, and they're probably not living under a palm branch as their house. We, we must re recognize that our ancient ancestors are probably significantly more brain power and intelligence than we, ha we have. I think they started off a lot smarter and we're, we keep getting stupider and stupider as you know, generations progress. Uh, no, no commentary on current generations or anything. Just, you know, I think we're, they, they were highly intelligent. They were highly inventive and they were building things that you and I, would, would, if it didn't record it in Scripture, we would probably go, there's no way they would have, you know, in just a couple of generations figured out how to make musical instruments and how to, you know, build, you know, tools and whatnot. Well, they certainly can figure out how to make bricks, right? Dry some mud, put some straw in it, you get a form, and you build some bricks out there in the sun or even use a oven to, to cure it, right? So they probably had brick building capabilities. So now they have everything they need. I believe agricultural resources, the, the water, the refreshing life-giving water of the two rivers, and they probably had an abundance of mud with which they could make bricks when they got to Shinar. And they also had access to asphalt that they could use for mortar. So they knew how to be, you know, bricklayers and, and, and build up whatever structures they wanted to build. So uh, with the resources that they had and a prime real estate location that they found, they determined to build the city and to build the tower that is the central figure of the entire city and the central figure of this story or this account that we're reading here in Genesis 11. Now, all we really know is that the intent was to put the city to have, or the tower to have its top reach into the heavens. Now, first off, let me just say, I don't think anybody is foolish enough to think that they thought that they could climb up to God, right, or even climb up to the moon. They just wanted a very tall tower. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about the possibilities of why that was here in a minute. But they were building a tower, but don't think they were foolish enough to think somehow they could pierce through the, you know, the universe and get out to where God exists um, or even get to the moon or the sun or anything else like that which obviously you couldn't survive if you did with the cold and the heat, either one. Um, but so in this book over here uh, that I read somewhat in preparation for this, uh, The Tower of Babel by Bodie Hodge from Answers in Genesis, uh, really good resources. Most, about half of the book is on the, the people groups, the family groups that came out of that and tracing them back through all their heritage and all the information that we've found in recent you know, uh, scientific endeavors to try and figure that out. But he records in here, um, in one of the chapters, talks about what, what was the purpose? Why did the people believe that building a tower was beneficial to them? Um, and so here's, I think, six things that he lists in one of his chapters there. So if some have speculated it's a place where they thought they might be able to survive another global flood. They didn't hear God's promise at the end of chapter 8 where he said he'd never, and in chapter 9, where he said he would never again flood the earth. So some speculate that, oh, we'll build a tower that's so high, it's even above the tops of the mountains or whatever, and the, we can survive the global flood without needing to build an ark to do it. Because, it, you know, for Noah got warning 100 years or 50 years or whatever the total time frame it was for him to get ready and to do that, but, you know, other people didn't get any warning. So, boy, if you see floodwaters coming, run up to the top of the tower, save yourself from God's judgment or, or the global flood that can take place. I don't consider that highly likely, my personal opinion, but um, that's po one possible reason why they wanted to build a tower. Oh, and here's why I threw this in. I guess I didn't realize I separated these. Um, here's what the, what, so... Not, this is not biblical in the sense of the Bible doesn't describe what the tower itself looked like in shape and size and structure, but there have been lots and lots and lots of research projects into this. They have found the foundations of a, a tower at Babel, and they've tried to structure that out. And of course, we know that there's ziggurats all around the world, okay, in, in South America, in, um, in Indonesia, and in all kinds of places. We got ziggurats, which is kind of like in pyramids or structures like this all around the world. So you take that, 
plus what we actually found in the city of Babylon, the ancient building sites of what was probably the tower, and they have uh, kind of reconstructed what they think it, what they were trying to build. They didn't even finish it, so we don't know what it was truly intended to look like. Even if we were standing there with a camera to take a picture of it, it never got completed, so we wouldn't be able to see it anyway. Um, but that's the, the structure that we believe, or, or most, many scholars believe. It's not, again, a biblical case that you can make here, but a, kind of a structure. It's got stairs. It's got levels. It, it kind of goes up, not in a traditional Egyptian pyramid kind of shape, but certainly has that pyramidal um, kind of ziggurat uh, shape to it that we would see in many, many places, which is another evidence of probably a, you know, a single common people group, because why do people who end up in South America or in you know, Asia and all kinds of different places build these very similar looking structures as part of their religious ceremonies or something else. Um, as far as size-wise go, it kind of talks about, so you see the Tower of Babel there, um, height and base about 300 feet each. Um, compared to the Great Pyramid of Giza, definitely smaller than that. Um, the Monadonk, I don't know, I've never heard of that one. Building in Chicago, uh, the Tower of Babel compared to a football field um, there on the far right. So anyway, uh, that's what we think. Again, the scriptures themselves say nothing about it, so this is all just add that to your repertoire of maybe, but maybe not kind of information. All right, so the second reason uh, for this is it's a place, this seems pretty likely, a place where you worship idols. Okay. that they're building this tower as a place. They want to worship the sun, the moon, the stars, the something else. And so they're building a tower that gets them closer to what they're trying to worship, which is um, you know, stars and whatnot in heaven. Um, to gain fame. Now, it does say in the Scripture they wanted to make a name for themselves. And they want to say, we're the ones who built this tower. Now, some people go, well, then there must have been other people around the globe. That is a possibility. Another possibility is they're thinking of future generations. We want grand, great, 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 great grandkids to go, our parents built this great tower, kind of tr giving tribute and honor to them as being so wise and so productive that they build this tower um, that lasts for generations and generations and generations. Um, it could be for just pure ast uh, astronomical observations. You know, they actually wanted to take measurements of the sun, the moon, the stars, um, we've been doing these kind of things. You know, the, the, that's what God gave them to us for. God gave the sun, the moon, the stars for we could track times and seasons and years and all these kind of things. And so there's lots of different things that can track, like the, the, the Stonehenge in, in, in England, it, it, ha, it seems to have original purpose to track, I think, solar eclipses, right? So they, they were building these things to pr perhaps to get closer to these making, you know, we build, you know, observatories today and telescopes and we build them on tops of mountains so we can get up out of the light pollution and look up. Well, they may have been doing very similar kinds of things 4,500 years ago or 4,200 years ago. Um, an altar for sacrificing to deity. So it may have been really, an, you know, not just worshiping idols, but some kind of an altar ceremony place. It's another possibility. Um, and a burial shrine, of course, we know that's exactly what the Egyptians were doing. The, the pharaoh, the king, wanted to have a very special place, and they had very religious overtones to it because they thought that's how they were going to get to heaven was to have this great big structure that had a point that went towards heaven, and they could you know, take out their organs that were you know, causing them not to get to heaven and all the stuff the Egyptians would do. Um, so we certainly know the Egyptians are there. So those are six possibilities that, you know, Bodhi, I don't think, came up with, and his, just to, for his own resources. That's what scholars have been speculating on all through the time, is why the tower, why was it built, and these end up being the six most commonly asserted viewpoints as to why the tower was built. So, but ultimately, whether any one of those six is correct or not, the tower was intended to keep population close rather than letting them spread out. They're building the tower. It's obviously central to their community. They're building cities, meaning businesses and houses and whatnot there. They want to keep the population close, right? And that's one of the reasons why they built the tower, and it's obviously one of the reasons why God came down to, um, to build 
uh, or to destroy the work that they were using to try and build this tower that God found offensive in one capacity or another, which he actually doesn't articulate to us why he told them not to do it or why they couldn't do it. All right, get out of that level of confusion. Um, Many of you probably have heard Nimrod that we talked about last week in the genealogy of son of Cush, son of Ham, um, as being the world, for, world's first dictator. Uh, just a show of hands. Anybody, anybody heard that about Nimrod? Okay. Um, it, it, th- that doesn't come from Scripture. It comes from like Josephus, who's a, a Greek historian around the time of Jesus, and the Targum of Jonathan, which is a Babylonian translation more of a commentary than a translation, in my view. I haven't read, the, read it, but I mean, that's my understanding of it. Uh, from the second century AD. Both of these, and I think several other historical documents, uh, refer to Nimrod as being the, uh, the cause, if you will, or the leader of the Babylonian rebel uh, rebellion that was taking place to build the tower and to, you know, in some way, re- rebel against what God was calling them to do. So that's where those thoughts and ideas come from. Um, And I would say most modern commentaries that I've read also link Nimrod to the Tower of Babel. But again, Scripture doesn't actually say that. So he's not mentioned. In fact, Nimrod isn't mentioned at all in Genesis chapter 11. He's only mentioned in Genesis chapter 10. Um, And and let's see, go back for a minute. His His name does mean to rebel, though. That is the you know, how you would translate the name Nimrod, it means to rebel. So his name does, in fact, mean a person who rebels. Uh, whether he followed through with his name, we don't know, but maybe that's the name he, were, he, he was given by somebody after he began a rebellion. I don't know. Uh, so, but he's not mentioned in Scripture beyond Genesis chapter 10. And Scripture also indicates that all, so this is the point I want to make here, well, Nimrod, if he's a world dictator, He not only was a dictator, he got everybody to agree verbally that this was the right thing they should do. Okay, notice it says, all the people said to one another, let us make, in fact, it says it three times, let us make bricks, let us build a city, let us build a tower. Okay, so if he's a dictator, he's got a lot of cooperation in accomplishing this task, because that's how scripture records it. So, what, was he the true dictator? Was he truly uh, the one who rebelled and caused the Tower of Babel event to occur? We don't know. Certainly ancient historians and commentators thought that that was the case. They don't have a biblical verse to make the connection. So, it's, we should be careful, I think, in trying to claim that Nimrod is the Tower of Babel, you know, uh, you know, mastermind or whatever, or rebel, rebel that goes along with that. So he may be, but it's not definitively concluded from Scripture. All right, so let's uh, take, I want to show you a quick chronology here of Genesis 10 and 11 as we're sitting here at this time, right? So we've looked at chapter 10, and we've looked at now this first nine verses in chapter 11, and we've seen that there's a whole population of people that have come, And there's now this spread of people because God dispersed them by stopping the building project and then confusing their languages. Okay, so let's talk about the genealogy or the chronology that's happened here. What I think we can prove or demonstrate from Scripture is is the following. Noah's three sons had many generations of offspring after the flood, okay? And we saw approximately 70 different male names given in the text as to the offspring of Shem, Ham, and Japheth in this couple of hundred year time frame. That's point number one. Number two, subsequent to the flood, all the people spoke a single language and they apparently lived in near proximity to one another because it seems that everybody's sort of guilty of the same crime when God confuses their languages and scatters them. Third point, For undisclosed reasons, most or all of the people journeyed to Shinar, which is a region that we also would call Chaldea, like Ur of the Chaldeans, where we're going to talk about Abraham in chapter 12, where the city of Babylon was eventually founded and still exists in some form or fashion today. 
We also know that, number four, number, once they were in Shinar, the people rebelled against God's commands by not filling the earth. That, he seems to be predominantly concerned that they're not, that they're all unified in something that he is opposed to, and they're not filling the earth. So he solves both problems by confusing their language. Now, back in chapter 10, it said, in the days of Peleg, four generations from Shem, right, he's a Shemite, for, you know, the great-great-grandson of Shem, the events described in Genesis 1, likely, uh, uh, Genesis 11, likely occurred. That in the days of Peleg, the earth was divided, or the earth was scattered, and that was in his days. He, and he's not in the same generation as Nimrod, by the way. Nimrod was three generations, not four, but they obviously could have lived at the same time. Number, uh, number six, that with the construction of the Tower of Babel, God intentionally, God's the one who did it, God intentionally confused the people with multiple languages, resulting in them scattering abroad rather than staying together. And I want to talk about that here in a minute. So, um, the, uh, so moving on, so number, point number seven, the events of Genesis 11, 1 through 9, account, clearly account for the dispersion of all people and the multiplication of languages. We've, in ancient history, we can identify at least 78 different languages that would have come from Babel. Of course, now there's more than 2,000 or 4,000, I can't remember now, the last I heard is way up there, maybe 3,000 languages, let's say, in the world today, or at least dialects or some kind of offshoots of, of a core language. Um, and so we see that this, this scattering and this multiplication of languages is clearly represented it to have occurred because God did this here um, as, as referenced in Genesis 10, 5, 10, 20, 10, 31 through 32. But the information of how and why he did it comes in chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. Okay. As I said, Nimrod was one generation older than Peleg. But both probably lived at the same time, so they may have been in co-conspirators or who knows how their, their individual contributions to the event took place. Number nine, many cities and territories were established in the years that followed God's judgment, right? So there's, there, there's not a sin to establish a city. Something else was going on here. It was that they were all of one language, they were building a tower, and they were not dispersing into the land they're not filling the earth as God had intended them to do. Okay. So last point, all ethnic people groups today, doesn't matter how dark the skin color, doesn't matter what shape the eyes, doesn't matter any other exterior or even interior characteristic, all ethnic groups today trace their ancestry back to Genesis 9 to 11. Right? So it's Noah and his wife, Shem, Ham, and Japheth and their wives, and then the 70 offspring that are listed there in chapter 10, and why they've gained ethnic diversity is because God scattered them with different languages, and some of them went north, some of them went south, some of them went east and west, they went everywhere, and then you start seeing these divisions of ethnicities based on both geographic location and the fact that they had different genetic characteristics depending on who they came from, Shem, Ham, or Yapeth. And we remember that uh, when we talk about like Ham, uh, Ham, while I want, don't want to engage in any kind of, of racial overtones, most of the groups, as you'll see on the map, most of Ham's descendants were darker melanin skin tone than like the, those in, in, in you know, the Nordic countries or something, right? They had different diversities. They went to different locations. And then it, after, over hundreds and even thousands of years, the diversity seemed to come into look more um, monolithic at, based on where they live. But we're all still descended. And all genetic testing has demonstrated and proven that we all come from one common set of parents. And three, and, and three of those sets of parents from about 4,400 years ago, which is Shem, Ham, and Japheth. All right, so let's talk about God's judgment. So Yah, it says Yahweh came and he judged them, and he's the one who caused this. So we'll talk about this. He doesn't really give us the reason. He doesn't say it was a sin to build a tower. He doesn't say it was a sin not to scatter, but clearly God is concerned that the people are rebelling 
and not following his instructions that he's already given to them. Okay. So I, I find it interesting, you know, because it, God, it's oftentimes in Scripture, we get an anthropomorphic kind of description of God. He came down to see. Well, God knows everything. He doesn't have to come down out of heaven to see what's going on on earth. But it's interesting uh, that it says, he, you know, he came down to see what was going on, and then he has a conversation within the Godhead. Let us, another one of these descriptions, just like in chapter 1 of Genesis, let us make man in our image. Now in chapter 11, let us go, let us, you know, go down there and confuse their language is, is uh, described here. So here Yahweh identifies the main contributing cause for the people to collectively rebel against him. They have unity of purpose and unity of language. Now, in, in our world here in 2024, we kind of think unity of purpose and unity of language is a good thing. So we need to kind of unpack why it may not have been good for them to have that. Well, I'll cover that in just a moment. The construction of the tower represents the beginning, not the end, of the people's full-scale march in their rebellion, right? They, they, they begin to build a tower. They begin to rebel. It's not the end of their rebellion to build the tower. It was the beginning of God's perceived, they're going to rebel, and if we don't do this, it was, it's going to get worse and worse and worse, going down and confusing their language and stopping the progression of this unified rebellion is better now rather than later when it actually reaches you know, its fruition or its full scale uh, rep recognition of the impacts that it would have. So if Yahweh allowed the unified rebellion to continue, then everything in their sinful hearts desired, he says, would be possible for them. We need to slow down their rebellious, rebellious wills and rebellious hearts, and he does. Okay, by his actions here. So as I said, he speaks to the other members of the triune Godhead. Let us go down. Let us confuse their language um, so that they will not understand one another. I can only imagine what that day was like. There's you're having a conversation. You're agreeing to do X, Y, and Z with your neighbor or friends or whoever, and suddenly you're speaking your language, and, and they're like looking at you like you're totally bizarre, and they try to say something back to you, and you're like, why won't you talk? You know, I mean, that day must have been very strange. Very, very strange. Um, and it may have even been violent. I mean, it may have, I mean, it may have been the increase in violence of people trying to communicate with others, getting frustrated, uh, or, um, you know, doing harm to one another because they can't understand one another that caused them to go away from each other. But you and I speak the same language. Let's go over here. Let's leave all these other people behind. I mean, I don't know exactly how it all played out, but it must have been a inter very interesting time in human history to see people who once could easily communicate with each other now are completely at odds, so much so that it caused them to disperse far and wide. And that caused them to be scattered. It's Yahweh's design and purpose to scatter them abroad. He wants the face of the earth covered with people, so it was after this event. So the confusion was immediate. I think that was clear in the text. Okay. It's the scattering all over the earth probably took centuries, maybe even a millennia. When did they first come to the Americas? Right? Did that, when it says they, when it, the text says he, they scattered all over the face of the earth, does that mean that within a couple of days they're now in America from Shinar? No, I don't think so. Right? I think they, my guess is, that it was, you know, kind of concentric circles of expansion. They, they get away from the people, and then suddenly there's more diversity, and there's more confusion, and more frustration, more territorial disputes, and they go a little further, and they go a little further, and they go a little further, and they walk across the Bering Strait, or they get in a boat that, like Noah built, and they end up over in the Americas, and we see evidence of that in ancient times, but uh, it, it's interesting because the people that like Columbus would have found here were probably not the original people who were originally here. There's been multiple generations or multiple transitions of different people groups if you study the actual history over the last 1,500 years. All right. Um, the city that they built was uh, in China was called, now called Babel or eventually Babylon. 
it says because and the, the name Babel, by, even in English, kind of means that, right? We, you know, Scott's up there on stage babbling all night long, right? We talk about it as we're talking something, and it's just it's confusing. It's not making any sense. Well, that's what it means in Hebrew. Babel means confusion in Hebrew. And it was the epicenter, and the reason why it's called Babel, because it was the epicenter of this confusion and spread of languages. Okay. So we'll, before the break, we'll conclude with this. Uh, the, I think there's a unity principle that's in play here that we should talk about. Unity, I believe, from Scripture is desirable and a godly trait for those who agree to submit to God's authority fully. It's good to submit. We're called to be in unity, right? And so isn't it good and pleasant for men and brethren to dwell in unity, right? It's good and pleasant. So there, there is an overriding principle in Scripture, I believe in Old and New Testament, that unity is important. But if we unify under the wrong principles, we unify under the wrong guidance and direction, if we unify under something that God despises and hates, he'd rather see us disunity than unified in some kind of ungodly pursuit. So the New Testament church, like families of the people of Israel, are called to dwell, dwell together in perfect unity. That's what I just quoted from Psalm 133.1. And Ephesians 4 talks about we're called to be in unity. But, we're, but notice like it, so, you know, in Psalm 133, how it's good and pleasant for people to dwell in unity. Yes, it is. In Ephesians, we're called to be in unity because Christ is the head of the church. If we are operating as a church, and that doesn't mean a building, it means the people in the church, we're the church. If we're not submitting to Christ's authority, we're off over here doing rogue kind of things, inventing our own truths, and doing things that God himself has said are wrong or that he abhors, then he doesn't really want unity. He wants us to be in unity in the church under the authority of Christ. Now that's a good condition of unity. But we've got to be under Christ. We've got to be under the authority that he's given us in Scripture. Or I don't think unity is God's plan for us. He'd rather have one person living for him without unity than being in a group of 100 people who are all rebelling and sinning blatantly against his will and against his purpose. So that brings us to point number three. However, ungodly unity is worse than having no unity. I think that's the biblical principle. Um, Psalm, you know, let me, I didn't put it on the screen. Let me read Psalm 2 real quick, just give you the, a sense of it. Plenty of different places you could look at. Psalm 2. Sorry, I can't flip these pages very fast. All right, uh, Psalm 2. Tear my Bible, but I don't want to do that. So, ah, oh, there it is. Psalm one, two, three, and four. All right. So, like here in Psalm two, just starting with the first couple of verses, it says, "Why do the nations rage, and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves together, and the rulers take counsel together. This is like coming together in unity and purpose. Okay. Uh, what, what are they doing? It against the Lord and against." his anointed, the Messiah, okay? saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. God's response is, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh and hold them in derision. Their unity is not good. That's the biblical principle is unity for the sake of unity is only good if it's under God's authority, if it's under God's will, and in the case of the church, if it's under Christ being the head of the church. So, therefore, I think the final point here, God builds unity where it's healthy to have unity among brethren, and God disrupts unity where it's harmful to the brethren, or harmful to his people, or harmful to people he wants to see repent and come to, come to him, you know, step out of the rebellion and into compliance and obedience to him. So, I, I think that's, there's a principles we can draw from Scripture. Yes, unity is important. But, you know, these, um, 
you know, ecumenical movements of let's all just be, you know, arm in arm and let's all just march together and it doesn't matter that we don't agree that Scripture teaches this about this particular doctrine or whatever. Well, we want to be in unity and I, and I you know, um, I want to be. I mentioned this before to most of you. You know, I, I meet every Tuesday at a, at a pastor's lunch and there's all kinds of different denominations represented at a pastor's lunch and, you know, we're there, but we are all there and the scripture absolutely dictates what we do as a uni- unity. We, you know, we sometimes talk about doctrine and sometimes we don't come under unity in certain texts, like whether well, soteriology, meaning salvation or something. But we can gather together and we can be unified because we all believe the scripture has authority. We all believe that, that you know, the basic tenets of the doctrine, we may disagree on finer points, but we can have unity there. But to just welcome anybody in, we welcome the Wiccans in and welcome in all kinds of different, you know, whatever, people with different, completely unbiblical viewpoints, that's not unity. We shouldn't be in unity in those. The men in that pastoral group that I meet with all verbally and and in their hearts affirm that Scripture is the ultimate source of authority. And so we can easily meet in unity in those things, even if we aren't uni- have perfect unity in, in, in doctrine and theology. All right, so there's that. Let's c- take our three to four minute break. I'll stop calling it five because I don't like five. So um, take three or four minutes here, break, and then we'll come back and finish what we can.